Ladies and gentlemen, hopefully you're having an amazing day. I want to kick this video off with a discussion of the RTX 30 and RTX 40 series of cards from NVIDIA. As you are likely aware, they are facing stiff competition at the moment from AMD thanks to the RDNA 2 architecture. And early next year, we will see the RX 6700 series launch as well, which will put a ton of pressure on NVIDIA's mid-range. So to counter that in the short term, NVIDIA are launching the RTX 3080 Ti, which is a slight cut to the 3090, likely launching in February, and cards such as the RTX 3070 Ti and the RTX 3060. But the question is, what's next? Because we know that NVIDIA are certainly not going to be stopping development of its GPUs. Currently, they are tasking Samsung and their 8NM process, and there's a couple of reasons that we know that NVIDIA would likely have done this. The first is that AMD are gobbling up a ton of TSMC's 7NM production, and honestly, it's not just AMD that are gobbling up, there are other companies too. The second is that Samsung most likely undercut what TSMC were asking for in the production of the GPU. So this means that we have now two series of rumors that have been swirling around. The first is that we will see some new variant of card on the 8NM process. We'll get into that in just a moment. And then what comes next is almost certainly a new architecture on the 5NM process known as Lovelace. The website kedglobal.com, or if you prefer, the Career Economic Daily, I'll link their article in the video description, along with the WCCF Tech article, which is where I first spotted this. According to industry sources, and this dates on the 17th of December, Samsung have clinched a, quote, second deal to manufacture NVIDIA's latest gaming chips. This deal, by the way, is worth a ton of money, apparently about 90 million US dollars, which I'm sure you'll agree is quite a chunk of change. There's no actual real information as to what this refresh is, so I'll give some speculation in just a moment. But naturally, um, this is a very lucrative deal for, uh, for, um, for Samsung, but it also makes a ton of sense as well because... This actually comes on the back of another report, which uh, Hexus.net uh, covered, and I'll link, of course, their article as well in the video description. Um, and basically, what we understand that TSMC are no longer offering large kind of discounts to their clients for 7NM. In fact, and I quote, it said that it's cancelling a sales allowance price reduction for major 12 uh, 12 inch wafer clients and that's actually very new and the reason is because according to tech analyst P uh, Patrick Moorhead we need another leading edge fab in other words Samsung um, are just not offering enough competition at the moment and the very bleeding edge and because everyone um, just is just completely and utterly hitting uh, TSMC's manufacturing so it's bursting at maximum capacity it's like well why the hell would I offer discounts to anyone that just makes no sense when I can't even you know if I, if I doubled capacity it would probably still be gobbled up so why would I give anyone a discount that makes absolutely no sense and honestly you kind of can't blame them it does also lead us to questions of whether this is one of the reasons that AMD have uh, slightly bumped the price of the Ryzen 5000 series is possibly they got heads up for this, but that's a story for a different time. Getting back to the refresh or super series, as I'm going to call it, and like WCCF call it here, there's two possibilities for this. The first is that we see it kind of like we saw with Turing, actually. It's a subtle upgrade in specification for whatever tier. So, for example, we would see a small increase in the number of CUDA cores. A good win here for uh, NVIDIA would also be to bump up the amount of VRAM. So, for example, an RTX uh, 3070 Super would have, say, 16 gigabytes of memory, a slight increase in the number of CUDA cores, and possibly a bump in clock frequency or whatever else. And the exact same thing as well for the RTX 3080, they would increase the amount of VRAM to, let's say, 20 gigabytes, maybe increase the clock frequency as well that the RAM was running at, as we know that 
there is a ton of overclocking headroom anywhere on the chips that they're using so that could be another option and basically they might decide to slightly shuffle the prices as well maybe a slight price reduction or keep them uh, basically slotting in and then eventually the RTX 3070 and other cards would become EOL end of line. The other possibility is that there are small subtle changes in architecture itself. To be clear, I mean that if you were to look at the two dot, uh, block diagrams between Ampere and I'm just going to call it Ampere 2.0, you would be very hard pressed to tell the difference unless you were really studying them. A good couple of examples here would be small changes to improve the power efficiency of the GPU, which would possibly mean that the GPU could maybe crank a little bit higher, doesn't require so much power, those type of things. Or maybe small changes on the architecture, like increasing the amount of cache or whatever on the GPU. The problem is, if you start to do that, you're adding, well, stuff to the GPU die, which possibly means it's getting bigger, so would they do that? I don't know, honestly. This is one of the reasons I'm a bit skeptical of them doing anything like that. Not to mention, it seems to be contrary to what kopt 7 Kimi has said. And they're a very well-known leaker. I don't think I need to introduce them at this point. They've gotten pretty much everything right when it comes to NVIDIA and the Ampere series of cards. And they've basically said that the refresh of uh, Ampere is not, quote, simple. And it seems to be what we're looking at with Lovelace. And in a separate tweet, uh, Kopity also mentioned that it seems like uh, Lovelace is going to be on the 5nm process of uh, Samsung. So that makes a ton of sense as well, given what we know about uh, the recent reports from Samsung and uh, the 5nm process. So if I had to guess, we won't see Lovelace launch next year. After all, Kopity said it's not, and given, again, it's every two years we've seen NVIDIA launch a new architecture, I think that makes sense. It's not like, you know, uh, let's say July or August or September or whatever, RDNA 3 is going to launch. Most likely it's going to be much later than that. I wouldn't be surprised if it's late next year, possibly even uh, 2022 that we see RDNA uh, 3 launch. It, of course, depends on a ton of market conditions. So my guess is that NVIDIA are not in a ton of rush at the moment. They don't have to be. Even if Intel put out a decent uh, GPU, like a really good GPU, I don't think NVIDIA are going to be beaten by Intel. I think that Intel are going to do decent with their, um, with their gaming GPU, but they're certainly not going to beat... Uh, NVIDIA in the first time round, at least I think it's very like unlikely, and even if they did have a superior GPU, let's just say for a moment they did, eh, okay, Intel have the best GPU for a while, but there's still going to be a lot of skepticism, are they going to have the best software, are they going to have full ray tracing support, are they going to have DLSS and all of these other features that at this point are just synonymous with NVIDIA and of course at that point with AMD. This is not to say that uh, Intel are screwed and cannot make any headway in the GPU arena. I think that there is a ton of potential there for Intel, but they're not going to make enough of a difference in the first architecture. It's going to be a while before they really start eating into NVIDIA's uh, in, into NVIDIA's market share. Another really cool thing that's been happening at the moment is resizable bar or smart access memory if you prefer the AMD term. This has been something that's got a ton of attention of late and of course it was a feature that was marketed heavily around the release of the Ryzen 5000 series and also the RX 6000 series but it is not a feature which is exclusive to either of those two products and it can work on Intel CPUs, NVIDIA GPUs when it's actually enabled, as well as, it appears anyway, older AMD CPUs. A Reddit user by the name of Merrick98, and she was testing it on a 1700X, and this is thanks to a BIOS which has become available for the Asus motherboard, a, B4, a B450, and he was testing it with, again, a 1700X. Unfortunately, he was only testing it with a Radeon RX 580, which is not ideal for this, so clearly it's much older than the RX 6800, so in his testing there was basically no difference at all between having SAM enabled or disabled, 
um, who basically found that it's essentially within margin of error, like half a frame a second, one frame a second difference. But also on the same subject, though, WCCF Tech were given a couple of very interesting uh, images. Full credit, of course, to them. Again, I will link that article in the video description. And they actually have seen a 4700G as well as a 3700X running with smart access memory. And this is on an MSI X570 board. What's even cooler about this is it's on an RTX 30 GPU as well. We know that NVIDIA can support it. They've mentioned many times. We're just waiting for the drivers. And I'm just really happy about this. Uh, it's... It's frustrating, honestly, that the industry weren't really taking advantage of this because it's literally part of the PCIe spec until AMD, well, basically kicked to both Intel and NVIDIA in the shin and were like, okay, you might want to do this now. To be fair, AMD are the only ones who have both a high-performance GPU as well as high-performance x86 CPU. Um, obviously, NVIDIA are working on an ARM processor. I've mentioned that before as an exclusive and Intel are kind of getting the whole uh, GPU thing down. Speaking of Intel, I also want to discuss an Intel XE discrete GPU which is leaked courtesy of Tim Apisak who found the entry on Geekbench. I will say that this appears to still be a quite early sample. It does not look like uh, the score we're seeing here is anywhere close to final. Um, according to what we're seeing, again, with Geekbench, we are looking at 128 execution units, which is actually more than the Max GPU from Intel, the XE Max uh, discrete GPUs for laptops. And uh, those things actually feature 96. So again, this is 128. And it seems to be paired with uh, 3 gigabytes of VRAM, assuming all of this is being read correctly by Geekbench. I don't think this is a great indicator of how these GPUs are going to perform. Um, I recently covered the fact that uh, Vulkan, of course, has a ray tracing support, which has now been basically finalized. And uh, in their documentation, they also mention uh, Intel's high performance gaming GPUs for next year as well. I think at this point, competition is good. I'm, I'm just of the mindset that if we did have more competition in the marketplace, it would only have been a good thing for this time of the year. Like, just imagine if Intel's GPUs were decent, at least in a couple of product tiers. Yeah, sure, you may have a preference. You may say, well, you know what, I, I just want to go with AMD or I want to go with NVIDIA. But at least it would help offset the market a little bit. At the moment, there is so much of total available market, which is just, it's just not addressable. It just, it, it's just going to waste and... Of course, that's just frustrating for everyone. So I really hope that uh, we do see an excellent GPU from uh, from Intel. And the last thing I want to tackle, because quite honestly, I just feel like I have to at this point, is Cyberpunk on uh, the consoles. Specifically, this revolves around Sony, who have pulled Cyberpunk 2077 from the PlayStation Store. And of course, I don't really need to say why after all of the bugs and the memes at this point. We've also seen CD Projekt Red's uh, share prices get absolutely decimated on the back of not only all of the fallout from gamers, but also the fact that, of course, we have seen Sony pull Cyberpunk 2077 from the PSN store. This, of course, doesn't really affect you if you want to buy the game, Physically, you can still do so, I guess, if you own like a, a, um, an, a digital edition of PlayStation 5, that could be a problem. But if you have like a, a disc version of the console or you've already bought it, that's not a problem. You don't have to do the refund thing. For the Xbox, it's still available to purchase as well as, of course, GOG and other services. And I would just like to say that while I think that CD Projekt Red have made a ton of mistakes, honestly, for this game, and we can argue about whether they should have released it on this generation of consoles or not. Personally, I don't think that the game should have been released, as it is anyway, on the Xbox One and PlayStation 4. Fair enough. If they had to delay the release and they had to patch it, I understand. But I wouldn't have even minded so much, in my opinion, if they had 
actually done the thing of showing off the game running on the base consoles. And they mentioned that this is a mistake, but really and truly, I think that that mistake is just, I would say, verging on dishonesty. Because they were show, and to be honest, they were even kind of reluctant to show the footage running on like the consoles, it felt like, on the Xbox One X. And yet, we saw no gameplay at all on the Xbox One base system or the PlayStation 4. And when you've got frame rates going into, like, the teens, it's just... I'm sorry, it's, it's just not acceptable. Um, if you shown the game and were like, you know what, it's buggy at the moment. Um, here's the problems we're having. Here's our plans on patching or whatever, you know, whatever PR way you want to handle it. I would have been okay, but I think given the fact that people went into this expecting not, you know, a game that was going to run at 120 frames a second at 4K or anything like insane, people have realistic expectations if you've got like an Xbox One base system or a PlayStation 4, you don't expect to be able to run at like, you know, 16K graphics with ray tracing, but you do expect more than 15 frames a second, and I think... I think that's worse, in my opinion, than any of the bugs, any of the crashes, any of this other stuff. I think the worst decision that CD Projekt Red made was just not showing off more of the gameplay. And I'm pretty sure as well, there was like an interview or a statement or something like that, where they said that the, the, the base versions of the game, the console versions, were running better, they were looking better than what they'd expected. Like, what, what did you think it was going to run like? Five frames a second? <laughs> Dude! Dude! Come on now! <laughs> it's just, it's absurd. It, it, it just, it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's just absurd. Like, if, 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 if the game, if you can literally go one Mississippi, two Mississippi, between each rendered frame, it's not acceptable. And, you know, they've also had these, um, these comments of, uh, you know, we, it, it was, um, you know, w with all that's going on in the world at the moment, and we didn't get access to the test, it's like, I'm sorry, but if you're a developer... Or you don't you don't have to be a you know a professional gamer. You don't have to be a games tester to look at this thing and say, hmm, it's like running at one four four p and it's hitting two frames a second. And yes, I'm slightly exaggerating. Maybe we shouldn't release this. And I I do think they were under a lot of pressure. Their share prices were getting well hit hard because of the delays. And I do think that. Not everything was their decision. Obviously, at the end of the day, they, they have to keep the lights on in the studio. I just think that this is a really good example of kind of a perfect storm and a perfect storm around the hype. And I hope um, people kind of take a few lessons away from this and um, maybe, just maybe... Next time a game is being so caging on a specific version when it's not showing it, we should be better as a community to kind of ask questions. And what did raise some flags for me was when they were DMCAing or shutting down early released footage, including like, not even from reviewers, like if I got sent, let's say a physical version of a game, it doesn't matter what it is, uh, or a product, you know, if a company sends me a product, if you know, AMD send me a graphics card and I show that graphics card online and I leak all of the benchmarks early and then they say, hey, we're going to ban you for that. That's 100% understandable. But when it's just some random guy or girl who have not signed any NDA or anything like that, they have nothing that uh, they've signed with uh, Cyberpunk, uh, sorry, with uh, CD Projekt Red, now, I do understand that in some cases they have the legal right to do this stuff, and that's an arguable gray area, but when they're doing it, it makes you very suspicious. And personally speaking, I'm playing Cyberpunk on a PC, and it's been okay for me. I've had a couple of glitches, but nothing that's, that's game-breaking. It's been relatively stable for me, but honestly, I'm just kind of brute-forcing it. 
Um, so I can't really speak for the PlayStation 4 and Xbox versions of the game because I'm not playing on a base Xbox or even the Xbox uh, Series X or PlayStation 5 on. As I said, I'm playing it primarily on the PC and it's been okay for me. Thanks to DLSS, it's making it a lot more playable and ray tracing does look quite beautiful. So what do you guys what do you guys think about this? Like are you have you tried it on a base system? Is it as bad as you know what we're led to believe? Is it, it, it do you think that they've handled this correctly? Has it affected your trust in CD Projekt Red? Um, they have sworn that they will fix this no matter what the cost is. Obviously, they need to to regain trust of customers. So let me know your thoughts on this. I think that's just about it though for this video. If you have enjoyed it, make sure to like the video and uh, definitely subscribe to the channel if you've not already done so. There will also, just a quick plug, um, in the next couple of days there will be a follow-up to the 1700X video which I put out um, a few days ago because I've got quite a few requests asking for me to carry on that investigation, whether it's worth an upgrade. So there'll be a follow-up to that video, so definitely get subscribed if you've not already done so. Be sure as well to click the bell icon because YouTube and notifications are sketchy friends at best. And I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.